Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna go through three of the four fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, K, and E. I've already recorded a video on vitamin D, which I suggest you watch. Let's take a look. So, let's first start with vitamin A. Vitamin A, which is the retinoids. Now when we look at vitamin A, we can take vitamin A in through plant material or animal material, and predominantly it comes as retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid. Now interestingly, in the body, retinol can turn into retinal, retinal can turn into retinoic acid, and retinal can reversibly turn into retinol. But once it is retinoic acid, it stays as retinoic acid, and we'll talk more about that in a sec. Like I said, we can get vitamin A from our food stuff, so we can get it from plant material, for example. And in plant material, beta carotene is a good example of it. And beta carotene is just two retinols glued together. Animal products that we can get it in include things like liver and kidneys for example and it can come as retinol, retinal or retinoic acid but it's a sterified with a long chain fatty acid, which is important because we need to play around with its esterification to that long chain fatty acid either pull it off or we'll put it back on depending on what we want to do with the retinol. So vitamin A, because it's fat soluble, it can be stored. And when we store it, we usually store it esterified with a long chain fatty acid, which is palmitate as the long chain fatty acid. Okay, what does retinol do in the body? So you've probably heard of retinol being really important when we look at the functions, really important for night vision. That's true. Specifically, what we're referring to is low or dim light. Its ability to respond to low or dim light and allow for you to be able to see something. It's also really important for maturation and development, so early on. It's important for maintaining healthy skin and mucosa, so mucus lining. And it's important for reproductive health. So for example, for males, it's important for sperm production, and for females, maintaining a healthy placenta. So that means it's, in, it's important throughout one's pregnancy. All right, let's talk about how all this happens. Let's first start off in a cell of the eye. So let's just say this is a cell of the eye. What is gonna happen is we'll take in retinol. It will get turned into retinol. Specifically, it gets turned into 11 cis retinol. And what 11 cis retinol does is it's like Gollum off Lord of the Rings, trying to find its ring. It really wants the ring and once it gets it, it doesn't want to let go of it, but it's really paranoid of somebody stealing it. So it's very anxious. It's always looking around. Now the ring in this case is going to be something called opsin. So I like to think of the O as the ring. Opsin. Binding to this 11 cis retinol and it actually produces something called rhodopsin. Now, rhodopsin is Gollum with the ring. It's having a look, it's waiting around, seeing what's happening. If a little bit of light comes into the eye, it stimulates it, scares it, it throws the ring away, it removes the opsin, it throws it away, and when it gets scared, it stimulates the optic nerve to send a signal to the brain. Now, this is happening at low light. We need rhodopsin to see at nighttime in low light. It's all because of vitamin A. If we have no vitamin A in our diet, we have no night vision. Really important. In actual fact, if we have no vitamin A for long periods, we can ultimately go blind. And sadly, half a million children around the world, half a million children around the world are blind because of vitamin A deficiency. 
Luckily, we began to fortify foods with vitamins like vitamin A, so golden rice, vitamin A fortified rice to try and prevent, because it's all preventative, prevent this blindness that's occurring. Now, too much or too little can be damaging. Too little can obviously result in reproductive issues. Sterility, for example, and blindness. Damage to the skin, because we know that obviously when we look at vitamin A, it's really important for maintaining healthy skin. And so one of the treatment options for acne is retinoic acid, right? All right, importantly, a pregnant woman, they don't want their vitamin A levels too low or too high. Both can be a threat to the pregnancy, which is extremely important. All right, the next thing is talking about what's happening. So this is just happening at the eye. How do we do all these other functions? Well. Let's just take another cell of the body, for example. And we know that in the cell of the body, we have a nucleus, and in that nucleus, we have DNA, which needs to be transcribed and then translated into proteins. So again, what happens is, retinol enters the cell, turns into retinal, turns into retinoic acid. Retinoic acid enters, I'll just write it as RA, and it promotes transcription of the DNA into an mRNA. That mRNA transcribes itself, translates, I should say, into proteins. And it's these proteins, depending on what tissue is doing this role, it's these proteins that may play a role in maturation development. They may play a role in maintaining healthy skin and mucosa. They may play a role in pro protecting and enforcing the placenta and also that for sperm maturation. So this is how vitamin A works. Let's now take a look at vitamin K. Vitamin K is really important when it comes to coagulation. So if you cut yourself, the thing that stops you from bleeding all over the place is we have platelets which plug up the area very quickly and then we have coagulation factors which are proteins that are expressed and they stick to those platelets to form this nice meshwork that stop any further bleeding and also promote regeneration of the damaged tissue. Vitamin K is extremely important in this process. So vitamin K is important for coagulation. Now this is what happens. Again, there is the DNA within our cells and we can transcribe that into mRNA and this mRNA is going to be an mRNA for a coagulation factor. Now there's heaps, right? Coagulation factor four, five, nine, ten. there's a whole bunch of coagulation factors. That then gets translated into a protein, the hero amino acids. And we know that proteins have side chains, for example. So there's a side chain. So this is a coagulation factor protein that's been expressed. It's been translated. Here it is, there's a side chain. Something needs to happen to it. What needs to happen to this protein is it needs to be carboxylated. Carboxylated, let's write that down. Simply, we've got to add carbon dioxides to it. Now, if we add carbon dioxides to it, we're adding carbon dioxides to that side chain. And what we end up getting, something that looks like that, and something that looks like that. Firstly, how does this happen? Vitamin K, vitamin K comes along, and it promotes this carboxylation. That's what vitamin K does. It promotes carboxylation, helps add those two carbon dioxides. You're probably thinking, who cares? All right, now that they're added there, and you can see they're negative, they can now bind to platelets to help mesh up, right? Create a meshwork around the, the damaged area and promote regeneration. This is how it works. You go damaged site, there's a cut, all right? To stop you from bleeding, luckily, our platelets have come along and they've plugged up the area. There's our platelets. When they do this, they become negatively charged. So there's a negative charge associated with them. All right. Then we've got this. I'm going to draw this more simply like this. Like that, like that. Like that. That is a coagulation factor. We have these coagulation factors here now 
But the thing is, they're negatively, negatively charged as well. They can't bind, negative and negative can't bind together. We need something that facilitates this binding, calcium. Calcium comes along, calcium has two positive charges associated with it. It binds to the platelets, it binds to the coagulation factors and brings them all in calcium. So calcium is allowing for this clotting to occur. But vitamin K allowed for the activation of coagulation factors. Do we still make coagulation factors without vitamin K? Yes, you can see that. They just don't become carboxylated and they don't promote clotting. This is important here because if you donate your blood to a blood bank, they give a collating agent, something that binds to calcium and stops it from doing this to stop your blood clotting in the bag. All right, All right so that's vitamin K. Last one we need to look at is vitamin E. Now vitamin E is an antioxidant, also known as tocopherol. Vitamin E, also known as alpha tocopherol. And what you'll find is that it is a potent antioxidant. Now, it's a potent antioxidant for peroxyl free radicals. So now we need to talk about what is an antioxidant, what is a peroxyl free radicals. Okay, antioxidant. It goes against oxidants, things that oxidize. So things that oxidize like to pull electrons off things. Loss, loss of electrons is oxidation. Leo, loss of electrons is oxidation. So an oxidant pulls electrons off things. We don't want to pull electrons off things. We've got cell membranes that are, remember, you've got a cell, cell membranes filled with fatty acids. Fatty acids have negative charges associated with them. So what's going to happen is these free radicals love to come along and steal electrons. It makes the membrane unstable. We don't want this. This is damaging. So we need antioxidants to stop it. Vitamin E does this. Now, peroxidation is when this happens to specifically fatty acids. Perfect. And so what happens is if a peroxyl, which may look like that, comes along, tries to steal an electron, it damages the fatty acid. It then is missing electron. It wants to go find an electron itself and it results in this chain reaction of issues of free radicals being produced and so forth. We need to stop it. So vitamin E actually sits in the membranes of cells. And when Peroxyl free radicals come along, it comes out and binds to it and stops it from doing this. But now the vitamin E is bound up with a free radical and is unable to do its job. It needs to be freed itself. In order to do this, vitamin C comes along, which will be the focus of another lecture, and frees that vitamin E and neutralizes the free radical. Perfect. That's what vitamin E does. Now, how do we get vitamin E? Vitamin E is really abundant in nuts, for example, and it's highly abundant in seeds, for example, but also liver. Liver is going to be a good source of many vitamins, probably too much vitamins, in all honesty. So this is vitamin E. It's really difficult to OD. It's really difficult to be deficient because it's stored, but it can happen. So here is a quick run through of the fat-soluble vitamins, excluding vitamin D.